They're undermining the trust in this by going and making clear here that he's using knowledge of what's happening in order to try and make tremendous amounts of money. Back in the summer of 2020, I made a video called The Economy is Not a Ship. The premise was that the sort of economic planning people were calling for in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the shortages of PPE and other goods we experienced because of it was not only impossible in theory, but in practice would result in corrupt deal-making between industry and the government. I believe now, as I did then, that if you put politicians in charge of the economy, whether it's through heavy-handed central planning or the comparative light touch of reshoring supply chains through tax incentives, subsidies, Cities, exclusive government contracts, etc., those politicians will respond to political or personal incentives rather than do what is best for the economy. In March of 2020, Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas and Representative Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin introduced a bill to cut off the U.S. pharmaceutical industry from Chinese manufacturing. The fact that so many of our pharmaceuticals were made in China was alarming, especially given the rhetoric from the CCP. An article in Xinhua, a CCP mouthpiece, argued that China should impose export controls on drugs after which America will be plunged into the mighty sea of coronavirus. India seemed to be following suit, as they imposed an export ban on hydroxychloroquine, a drug that, at the time, looked like it might be useful as a therapeutic for COVID-19. This was a scary time for all of us, and free traders like me seemed as though we were on the ropes. So where are we at two and a half years later? China is still enforcing strict lockdowns, much to its own detriment, while most of the rest of the world has moved on. Turns out that hydroxychloroquine wasn't really effective as a therapeutic, and India lifted the export restrictions pretty much right away anyways. Private industry, with their diverse supply chains, cranked out the most effective vaccines quite quickly. Meanwhile, the ones produced by the Russian government and the Chinese government seem to be working considerably worse. Ironically, there was quite a bit of overlap between people who were the most hawkish on reshoring supply chains and the people who were the quickest to call for us to return to normal. I think they were actually right on the latter. But why would we try and keep our economy in emergency mode at all times? Do I feel vindicated by this? A little bit. Maybe that's just confirmation bias. Going back to my video on reshoring supply chains, I did make a prediction that I'd like to revisit. Crystal and Sagar, who were still at the Hill at the time, were in favor of reshoring supply chains. So of course, we should have the ability to supply our own medical mm. supplies and essentials and many other things, by the way. Food supply is another one that I would throw in there as well. And it's ironic, the defense, because it's like, you know, these neoliberals uh, in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party are the ones who allowed all that stuff to go over to China. And now that it's there, the argument is, well, we can't make them mad because they have all our stuff. Like, we need them. Well, you're the one who created that dependency. Referring to the Cotton Gallagher bill, I said, this. As I write this video, Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin and Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas are working on a bill to bring back supply chains for pharmaceuticals from China. The fourth leg of that bill aims to provide incentives for manufacturing in the United States. The legislation will allow for immediate expensing for firms that incur costs associated with expanded pharmaceutical or medical device manufacturing within the United States. So they're going to pay people to make stuff here. I think we call that corporate welfare. That's what it is. Furthermore, if passed, the bill will allow for waivers on new regulations that the bill imposes when the regulatory agencies deem it appropriate. I don't know this to be sure, but I have a sneaking suspicion that the big, politically well-connected corporations are going to benefit from this way more than anyone else. And when they do, Crystal and Sagar will be scratching their heads talking about how big business wins yet again. Honestly, it's adorable that anyone thinks that such a bill would do anything else. The bill didn't get passed, fortunately. In fact, most of the reshoring supply chain efforts have fallen by the wayside, with with one exception. As of the writing of this video, a significant piece of legislation aimed at producing more semiconductors in the United States is on the verge of being passed. The bill is called the Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors for America Act, or the CHIPS Act. I absolutely hate that they always have to make every bill into some clever acronym. This is not a direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but it definitely is tangential. Given that semiconductors are considered essential for national security purposes, since they go into pretty much all electronics, and given that recent shortages are supply chain related, which is largely due to the pandemic. 
This is something that the Breaking Points crew, Sagar in particular, have been following closely. The production is what matters more than anything, both from a geostrategic point of view. I mean, look, this is part of the reason why if China invaded Taiwan, the U.S. economy, I'm not kidding, would shut down within like six months. Yeah. Like the U.S. consumer electronic, uh, gone. I mean, no more phone, no more televisions. Like everything that we use is over. And that is a bad situation. You shouldn't have a single choke point that exists like that. Something like 786 chips manufacturing facilities have gone overseas yes. in the past several decades. And it has left us with almost no um, domestic manufacturing capability. This is really critical. It's critical for you as a consumer. This is in all your electronics. Um, this is in a lot of the new cars, especially the new electric cars, yes. um, really dependent on this technology. It's also really critical for defense, and this is why uh, part of why Republicans are so interested in it is because you have to have these chips to be able to manufacture the advanced weaponry that mm -hmm. we depend on. So what exactly does the CHIPS Act do? The short answer is that it throws a lot of taxpayer dollars at semiconductor manufacturers. As the Washington Post reports, much of the $52 billion would go to chip manufacturers to incentivize construction of domestic factories to produce the components, which are the brains that power all modern electronics. The bill also includes about $100 billion in authorizations over five years for programs including expanding the National Science Foundation's work and establishing regional technology hubs to support startups in areas of the country that haven't traditionally drawn big funding for tech. Elected officials can never just do something straightforward. They always have to try and accomplish some ancillary goals in addition to the main one. Just take a look at marijuana legalization in California if you want to see how catastrophic that can get. Chip manufacturing giants, including Intel and TSMC, have already said they are counting on receiving some of the U.S. semiconductor subsidies to help finance factory construction projects in Ohio and Arizona. Global Foundries, another big chip producer, also hopes for some of the funding to support factory expansion in upstate New York. Now, shoveling billions of dollars at big corporations strikes me as corporate welfare. Bernie Sanders, of all people, agrees with me. Should American taxpayers provide the microchip industry with a blank check, blank check, of over $76 billion at the same exact time when semiconductor companies are making tens of billions of dollars in profits and paying their CEOs exorbitant compensation packages. Now, maybe you're for that, or at the very least, maybe you think it's worth it. Fine. Just know that everyone thinks the subsidies that go to their industry are essential as well. It's true that the pandemic has exposed some weaknesses in supply chains. This is definitely the case for semiconductors. And given that they are an essential input for electronics, this has had downstream consequences which have affected consumers. Just look at the auto industry. Like many other things, demand for new vehicles plunged early on in the pandemic. As a result, automakers canceled a lot of orders for semiconductors, which are used in the electronics of cars, as they anticipated demand would stay low for quite some time. Thanks to the large amount of fiscal stimulus by the federal government, consumers had more money than usual. And since most services were still closed thanks to shutdowns, consumers put this extra cash towards durable goods, including cars. Automakers were caught flat-footed by demand rebounding so quickly, and did not have enough semiconductors, among other things, to meet demand. And now prices for new and used cars are sky high. This is only one of many problems. So yes, it's not like relying on international supply chains for semiconductors hasn't caused problems. The thing is, since there's money to be made, the private sector will respond. By not producing cars, automakers are missing out on lots of potential sales. The same goes for everyone who produces electronics or anything else that has semiconductors. Semiconductor manufacturers, in turn, are missing out on their own sales. This provides powerful incentives for the industry to find a workaround, including, yes, boosting domestic manufacturing, which is exactly what's already happening. But first, let's talk about the state of the industry in the first place. We are not nearly as reliant on foreign supply chains as you might believe. As the Semiconductor Industry Association said in their industry report for 2020, in 2019, about 44% of U.S. headquartered firms' front-end semiconductor wafer capacity was located in the United States. So a plurality of semiconductors that we use are being produced within the United States. That's a higher percentage than any other country. Other leading locations for U.S. headquartered front-end semiconductor wafer fab capacity were in Singapore, Taiwan, Europe, and Japan. All folks who we are friendly with. 
it is notable that China has attracted less U.S. investment in front-end fabrication than the other major markets. The same report warns about how overseas competitors are outpacing the United States, however. They attribute this to incentivization programs, the sort of which the CHIPS Act is, and call for the United States to replicate those policies. Go figure, a lobbying organization wants such a program here. While I'm sure various chip manufacturers would love taxpayer dollars to support them, they appear to be investing their record profits in increasing capacity without the government. As the Cato Institute reports, instead of just sitting on this cash, chip makers are investing around the world, including in the United States. For example, Samsung, which began operating a Texas manufacturing plant in 2016, is investing in a second Texas facility, and Intel and TSMC have opened new facilities in Arizona. According to Harvard's Willie Tsai, these U.S. plants will proceed with or without federal subsidies because chipmakers want to take advantage of the country's skilled workforce and to be close to specialized U.S. equipment manufacturers that churn out many of the tools needed to make cutting-edge semiconductors. He also acknowledges that the company's subsidy demands are really just a cash grab. Maybe we really do need to shower these companies with taxpayer dollars in order to bribe them to make more semiconductors here. Though the trends in terms of R&D spending, productive capacity, and production output suggest otherwise. Even if you think that government involvement of this sort is necessary, you still have to reckon with the practical implications of doing this. When the government implements policies such as these, they're not designed by Vulcan-like bureaucrats who are solely focused on doing what is best for the economy from some mythically objective standpoint. They're crafted by politicians who have their own agendas. Do you trust these politicians to work in favor of the people they're supposed to represent, or do you think they'll prioritize their own interests? Well, recent events would indicate the latter. In mid-July, Paul Pelosi, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi's husband, purchased stock in a company that produces semiconductors. As MarketWatch reports, according to the disclosures, those disclosures that are legally required for family members of representatives to make when they purchase stock, Paul Pelosi, who owns a San Francisco-based investment firm, purchased between $1 million and $5 million in NVIDIA stock on June 17th. It's worth noting that NVIDIA designs its own chips but hires other companies to manufacture them and likely would not directly receive benefits from subsidies related to this congressional bill. Paul Pelosi later sold the stock at a loss, presumably because of the public shaming that came about when the disclosures revealed this information. Crystal and Sagar were rightly upset by this. And this is why I'm so pissed off about it, is because they're undermining the trust in this by going and making clear here that he's using knowledge of what's happening in order to try and make tremendous amounts of money. If this goes through and it goes well, he's actually set to make even more money than your average trader, millions and millions of dollars on specific bets clearly influenced by government policy while his wife is the speaker of the house and obviously has tremendous impact on this legislation. Nancy and her husband have done quite well over the years. According to most accounts, they're worth well over $100 million. Congressional representatives make a decent amount of money, but not nearly that much. It's not crazy to think that she's used her powerful position to help her family financially. That or her husband is just that good of a hedge fund manager. I hope none of you are gullible enough to believe that. I understand that people like Crystal and Sagar want to implement certain reforms to prevent potential conflicts of interest like this. I'm sure these reforms would help some, but I think you're inevitably going to run into self-serving actions from elected officials. Politicians are not a particularly bad breed of human. In fact, they're just like the rest of us in that they're fundamentally self-interested. The more power you give them over the economy, the more they're going to use that power to benefit themselves. Put politicians in charge of the economy, and they're going to respond to political or personal incentives, not economic ones. By asking for government management of the economy, you are necessarily asking for corruption. Mm.